Thank you for um, the opportunity to uh, speak to all of you and to share uh, some work and get your get your feedback. So if uh, anyone would like uh, more details or uh, to get in touch with me, all the papers, everything else is at uh, these these websites here. And so the, there, there are four basic points that I would like to get across today. The first is that there are really some very significant knowledge gaps about the control of large scale anatomical homeostasis. And uh, this is roughly, it's, it's, uh, it, it encompasses our understanding of the relationship between the genome and the anatomy. And I'll show you why things are um, quite puzzling there. And uh, I will claim that fundamental advances in new biomedicine are going to require not only understanding the molecular mechanisms that are required for this process to happen, but actually also uh, the decision-making by cellular collectives that is sufficient for it to happen. And that a key medium for computation in living tissue is something uh, that is called non-neural bioelectricity. Now, we've developed some techniques to manipulate this layer of basically physiological software, and I'll show you why I say that. And fundamentally, looking towards the future, I will argue that cracking this bioelectric code that will enable a kind of uh, novel approach of using electroceuticals for applications in birth defects, regenerative medicine, cancer, and synthetic bioengineering. And uh, boiling down the whole talk into basically two sentences, what I'm going to tell you is that like the brain, your body tissues form electrical networks that make decisions. These are decisions about dynamic anatomy, and that we now have the ability to target the system to control large-scale editing that can even override all kinds of uh, genomic default states with lots of advantages and opportunities for regenerative medicine and synthetic bioengineering. And I show you one of our five-legged frogs uh, to just uh, point out that uh, you're going to see all kinds of weird creatures today. None of this is Photoshop. These are all um, actual living things that represent our attempt to test some of the, some of the models that, that we have. So uh, let's, look at, uh, let's look at these knowledge gaps. Um, if we think about what is the end game of our field, we, you know, where, where are we going? At what point can we all go home? What we would like to have is uh, something that we call the anatomical compiler. The deal is that you ought to be able to sit down and draw the animal or plant that you would like to have at the level of the anatomy. So not at the level of pathways, but at the level of final anatomy, the way that we do with uh, machine parts and things like this, then you would be able to draw this, this, this three-headed worm. And if we knew what we were doing, we would have the, the capability of, of having the software, which would then uh, compile this anatomical description down into a set of stimuli that would have to be given to cells that would cause them to produce whatever it was that you just drew. So here's this three-headed um, flatworm. Now, the reason that this is, this is fundamentally important is that uh, almost all of the problems of biomedicine, so, so except for infectious disease, pretty much everything else, birth defects, traumatic injury, cancer, aging, all of these things would be uh, solved if we had the ability to tell cells what to build. If we had uh, the, uh, the, the knowledge to control what it is that cellular collectives cooperate towards building. So all of these things are in some important sense problems of information processing. How is it that uh, cells work together to build these things? And so, of course, we are very far from having anything like this. Um, and uh, only in a few very special cases do we know anything uh, about how to make specific uh, specific shapes, shapes come out. So let's think about why that is. So, so where is anatomy specified? I mean, we all start life roughly like this. So this is a collection of embryonic blastomeres. And then shortly thereafter, you get something like this. This is a cross section through a human torso. So look at this incredible invariant order. All of these organs are the correct shape, size, uh, uh, um, uh, position, uh, uh, orientation, everything is next to the right stuff. Uh, it, 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 it's absolutely staggering amount of, amount of order. And so we would like to know, first of all, where is this information coming from? We're tempted to say DNA, but of course we know what genome specify. The DNA specifies proteins. There's nothing directly in there that specifies any of this. So we would like to know how is it that cells use the genomically specified hardware that they have to know what to make and when to stop. In regenerative medicine, we would like to know if a piece of this is missing, how do we get the cells to rebuild it? And as engineers, we ask what's actually possible to, get, to build given any particular default genome. 
And so the reason that uh, in my group, we frame this thing as a basically a collective intelligence problem is that individual cells are extremely competent. So here you see one cell. This is a single cell organism. This is called the lacrimaria. And uh, there is no brain. There's no nervous system. There are no stem cells. There's no cell to cell communication, just one cell handling all of its local goals. So it's, it's uh, handling its uh, physiological goals, anatomical uh, control, uh, uh, metabolic, behavioral, everything is handled by this one cell in real time, okay? And so the amazing thing is that these, these cells, which are extremely competent in their local, very small sort of environment, when they work together to make a metazoan body, they can work on much bigger goals. So what you see is, a, is an inflation, not only of body size, but actually of of their ability to pursue states in, uh, in various kinds of uh, problem spaces, including anatomical morphous space, physiological space, and so on. So a single cell can uh, give rise to a, a, a collection of cells that self-assembles into some incredibly complex morphology. And we know that simply uh, understanding stem cell biology is not going to be enough because here we have a teratoma and this thing might have hair and teeth and bone and muscle and skin. And uh, so, so, so the, the um, work of the stem cells has proceeded fine. You have all your derivatives, you, you, you have your, your various tissues. What you don't have is this three-dimensional structure. So we need to understand how this works. And in a standard developmental biology, the story that we're told is a uh, kind of a, a feed-forward open loop system, which um, is, is very much based around emergence. So the idea is that there are gene regulatory networks, so genes turn each other on and off. Some of these genes uh, are effector code for effector proteins, so they are sticky or they diffuse or they exert force or something like this. And then there's this physical process uh, where all of these things interact with each other. And then uh, through things that are studied by the science of uh, complexity and, and so on, out come uh, these amazingly complex uh, results. So like the salamander here. So um, this now, this story is, is certainly true in the sense that th these things all happen, but, it ha but it's incomplete, I think, and it has a fundamental difficulty, which is this inverse problem. The idea is that if we're committed to this feed-forward emergence story, then making changes here require us to, uh, to, to exert our, our interventions down here, at the, at the, at the, for example, at the genetic level. And that means that we have to try to invert this process of emergence, which is fundamentally uh, insolvable, so, right? So most of these inverse problems are, are just too, too difficult to solve. How do you know what genes to tweak to make desired changes at the, at the three-dimensional anatomy level? So the current uh, state of affairs is basically this. We're very good at things like this, at figuring out the lowest um, hardware level of which genes and proteins um, interact with which other genes and proteins. But what we'd really like to understand are things like this, the ability of planaria to regenerate from pieces, the shape of the hand and the shape of the foot uh, and why they're different and what you would have to do to get these specific shapes back. Okay, it's very not obvious what you would do at this, at this level. So the amazing thing is that some animals are uh, very good at this and their bodies show remarkable plasticity in this uh, kind of uh, collective activity of the cell. So for example, here, this animal is a salamander. It regenerates its limbs, its eyes, its jaws, uh, its uh, portions of the brain and the heart. And so, so if they're amputated, they will grow back. And uh, what's, what's cool is that not only is this process incredibly flexible, meaning if you amputate at the shoulder, you grow the whole thing. If you amputate at the wrist, you start here and you just, and you just grow the parts you need, but then it stops. And that's the most remarkable part of all of this. And so lots of people work on trying to kickstart regeneration, but actually how does it know when to stop? Because when it stops is when it has built a correct salamander arm, that's when it stops. How does the system know when it's built a correct salamander arm? Now, it's important to note that this is not just some weird quirk of, of uh, salamanders. So uh, the human ma mammals can do some of this. The human liver is highly regenerative. That's been known for a long time. Unclear to me how the Gre ancient Greeks knew that, but they clearly did. The human liver is regenerative. Uh, deer regenerate uh, huge amounts of, of bone, up to a centimeter and a half of new bone per day. Okay, every day over a centimeter of bone growth. And so so uh, bone, um, vasculature, innervation, skin, and even human children can regrow fingertips. Uh, usually it stops at a, at a particular age, but if you just keep it clean, the amputation will give rise to a cosmetically perfect finger. So um, 
And the champions of this process are these guys. These are planaria. These are flatworms. They have a true brain, central nervous system, the same neurotransmitters that you and I have. Uh, and the amazing thing about them is that you can cut them into lots of pieces. The record is 275. And um, every piece will regrow exactly what's missing. No more, no less to give you a perfect tiny little worm. While the new stuff is growing, the remaining tissue is actually shrinking so that they will uh, all it, as quickly as possible get to proportion to correct proportionality. And the other thing about them is they're immortal. There's no such thing as an old planarian. So if you're interested in aging or these ideas that the things inevitably wind down and accumulate errors and so on, planaria have, have, are telling us that that is not absolutely required. Here's a life form that's basically immortal. And uh, the thing to understand about all of this is that we really are not, despite all the amazing progress in molecular genetics, we're really not very far along in understanding how the cellular collectives make, make decisions. And one of the easiest ways to see that is to just think about um, chimeric organisms. So, so here's a simple example, which we're making in my lab right now. Here's an axolotl larva. Axolotl larvae have legs. Here's a frog larvae, a tadpole. Tadpoles do not have legs. And one can ask a simple question. If I combine early uh, axolotl tissue with early frog tissue, right? So, so in early embryogenesis, I make a chimeric, uh, chimeric embryo. They're perfectly healthy. These are, we call them frogolotls. We have the genomes. We have the axolotl gene and we have the frog genome. And now we ask a simple question, you know, for, do frogolotls have legs, right? And even though we have all this information, we actually have no idea how to predict in advance whether frogolotls will have legs. And if so, will they be made entirely of axolotl cells or both, both types of cells or what? So these are the kinds of things that we would actually like to, um, like to understand. And the, one thing that's very important as part of this process is specifically the algorithm that enables robustness and uh, the handling of novelty. And I'll show you a simple example of that. So we discovered this a few years ago. So here is a tadpole and uh, it has eyes here. It has nostrils and, and a mouth down here. All of these things have to move around in order to get to a frog face, okay? So during metamorphosis, the face has to deform. The jaws have to come out, the eyes have to move forward, everything has to move. So it was thought that somehow what the genome did was to give each piece of the face a particular uh, direction and amount of movement. And that, that way, standard tadpoles become standard frogs. What we did was we created what we call Picasso tadpoles. Uh, so, so everything's in the wrong position. The eyes are on top of the head. The mouth is off to the side. The, the, every, everything is, is mixed up. I'll show you in a minute how we do it. But the amazing thing is that these animals become pretty much normal frogs because all of these different organs move around through unnatural paths, and sometimes they go too far and actually have to back up, but everything moves around until it gets to a correct frog face, and then the remodeling stops. So in fact, what the genetics does specify is not a bunch of hardwired rearrangements, but a system that executes a really flexible error minimization scheme. It's able to start off at incorrect or, or abnormal positions and still get to where it needs to be. This parenthetically matches William James's definition of intelligence, which is the ability to reach the same outcome despite perturbations and starting from novel um, starting configurations. So how does this system know uh, what a correct face is and how, and how do we get there? So we've been thinking about this, this, this problem and we would like to, my background is computer science. And so uh, to me, all of this looks like a problem of information processing at different levels. And what I would love to know is, uh, could we go beyond the hardware and, and operating at this level and ask about the algorithms? How are these decisions being made? What do the cellular collectives measure? What are, do, are there modules um, or subroutines? Um, how are these global patterning goals specified and stored? And in particular, how reprogrammable is any piece of biological hardware? So in computer science, there was this really interesting journey that, that we took from this is, this is what programming looked like in the 1940s and 50s. In order to get the computer to do something different, you physically had to rewire it. You had to rearrange the hardware. You had to move the wires. But what computer scientists realized is that if your hardware is good enough, and I'm going to argue that biological hardware is definitely good enough, what you can do is something really interesting. You can reprogram the machine without touching the hardware, basically by giving it stimuli or experiences, basically inputs. And that will allow you to program in a much higher level language where you're not drowned in the details of the hardware or even the machine language, 
which are actually able to take advantage of some really um, high level uh, types of uh, programming strategies uh, to get very complex kinds of outcomes. And I'm certainly not arguing that living things are computers in the, in the sense that they're not, of course, they're not built to the same architectures that, that our current computers are. But this idea of reprogrammable hardware and of um, uh, controlling, your, controlling a system by inputs and stimuli as opposed to physical rewiring is very powerful. So what we try to do is to, is to uh, come up with a scheme where uh, there's, a, there's more feedback here so that basically when the system is deviated from its normal target morphology, be that with injury or uh, teratogenic drugs or um, pathogens or with, you know, whatever, when the system is deviated from this, uh, feedback loops kick in both at the level of genetics and physics, and we're going to talk about this physical one here, that try to minimize the error the delta between where we are now and where we need to be. This is a classic homeostatic loop. It's what the thermostat in your house does. It measures against a set point. And if uh, error is beyond a tolerable amount, it will undertake corrective action. So um, several things to, to note here. The first is that, of course, feedbacks are not new in biology. Everybody knows we have feedbacks. But there's something, something different here. The first is that the set point of this process and every homeostatic system has to have a set point towards which it tries to reduce error. The set point here is not a single number or a scalar like pH or, or a, um, a metabolic hunger rate or is a hunger uh, uh, range or something like that. It's actually a fairly complex set of information that in, in some rough coarse grained way describes what a correct anatomy should be. Okay, So it's kind of a complex piece of information. The other thing is that this is very much a goal-directed process. Now, when I say goal-directed, I don't mean something magical or uh, or mysterious, it's goal-directed in the cybernetic sense. We've had devices that are goal-directed agents for you know, since the 40s and 50s, and all it means is that it's able to execute this error minimization loop. But the cool thing about systems that work like this is the following. When you want to change what they do, you don't have to be rewiring the hardware back here. If you understood how the set point was encoded, you could change the set point and get the exact same cells to build something different. Right? And that's the amazing thing about um, any, any uh, system that utilizes this kind of architecture, that you can actually make changes without even necessarily knowing how, how all the parts of the loop works. All you have to do is re rewrite the, the set point. And so our strategy for some years now was, was, was this. We tried to identify uh, some of the mechanisms at work here, in particular, understand the homeostatic set point. How does the tissue store the pattern towards which it tries to remodel? And then let's rewrite that pattern and let's let the cells build. And that's part of uh, trying to decode the, uh, this, this aspect of, of, of the collective um, behavior of, of these cells. So let's talk about um, how, how we've been doing it. So we uh, have uh, started looking at something called developmental bioelectricity. And what I'm going to show you now are, first of all, the methods. So, so how do we do this? And then show you some proof of principle applications. Why, why is this interesting? And I want to point out at the beginning that, you know, all cells in vivo sit with, within this complex morphogenetic field of information that tells them what to do as part of a larger unit. This information comes in many flavors. So chemical, extracellular matrix, tensions and stresses, so biomechanics, um, all kinds of things. And of course, bioelectricity. So Bioelectricity doesn't do this alone. It works with all of this other stuff. I'm just going to focus today on bioelectricity because I think it's, uh, it, it has, a, it has a, a particular aspect to it, which is that it's not just another piece of physics that you need to know to understand uh, anatomies. It's actually a, a computational layer that gives some privileged access to the control of complex anatomical features. It is the medium in which the computations are being made to make decisions about the length and the size and the shape of things. And so accessing this, this bioelectricity gives you, uh, gives you a, a, a remarkable uh, insight into, into what's going on beyond bottom up uh, molecular mechanisms. So the, the uh, kind of inspiration for how to think about this, we took from, from directly from neuroscience. Um, in neuroscience, this, this story, of course, will be familiar to everybody. The hardware is, is, is simple. You have uh, a collection of cells. Each cell has ion channels in, this, in the plasma membrane. They set voltage values across. Uh, that's, that's the resting potential, which can go up and down. And it can propagate to the neighbors via these electrical synapses. Okay, So that's, that's, that's what's, uh, what's there. 
And those kind of networks underlie this amazing uh, software. And, and here you can see this, uh, this, this, this physiology in a living zebrafish brain as the fish is um, undergoing whatever cognitive activities zebrafish can do. And you can see, you can see here uh, the, electrical, um, the electrical activity. And the commitment of neuroscience is that if we were able to decode this, if we understood how to read this information, we should be able to, through a computational approach, we should be able to figure out what the animal is remembering, what it's thinking about, what decisions it's making. Um, the semantic and uh, functional cognitive structures are to be read out from the electrical activity of the brain. That's what we believe. Well, it turns out that actually all cells do this, okay? All cells have ion channels. Most cells have electrical synapses known as gap junctions to their neighbors. And we have undertook, uh, undertaken this, this project to try to do the same kind of decoding. So here's, here's an embryo, and we would like to read all the electrical conversations that bind the individual cells into a collective that uh, can undergo anatomical homeostasis towards large uh, states, like, like build a limb, build a kidney, and, and, and so on. And on the one hand, it's, it's strange and surprising to many people to think about somatic cells as having this kind of neuroscience-like um, aspect to them as if they're processing information, they're having, having goal states and so on. On the other hand, if you ask where did neurons come from, of course, they didn't just appear out of nowhere. They speed up, evolution just speed optimized things that cells have been doing for a really long time, since around the time of bacterial biofilms. All of the uh, components of, of neurons that, that are really important for this, the, the channels, the, the neurotransmitter machinery, all this stuff existed before um, even before multicellularity, and even bacteria were using this to coordinate information across the um, across the film. So we we developed some tools to study this. Um, the the first is just is just how to detect and model them. This is uh, a voltage sensitive fluorescent dye, which basically just reveals uh, in the living state non invasively, so you don't have to poke the cells with um, with electrophysiological uh, uh, tools, every every cell is now reporting around its membrane, all the voltages, this is a, an early frog embryo. Um, so in time lapse sorting out which cells are going to be left and right and dorsal ventral and so on. And uh, in addition to that, we do a lot of computational modeling so uh, try to say well if we know what ion channels and pumps are in the membrane. Can we explain why the voltage is the way it is and why it changes as a function of time the way it does? And so let me show you a couple of native bioelectrical patterns. This is what we call the electric face. This was uh, discovered by uh, Danny Adams in my group. And she uh, used voltage dyes to look at the frog embryo putting its face together. Okay, And so this, is, of course, is a time lapse. And what you can see, this is one frame taken, off, taken from that movie. What you can see is that long before the genes come on to regionalize the face into the eye, the mouth, and everything else, all of the bioelectrical um, uh, uh, properties set up a pre-pattern, a scaffold that tell you where everything is going to be. So here's where the animal's right eye is going to be. The left eye will come in shortly. Here is the, uh, here's the mouth. Here are the, some placodes. This bioelectrical pattern is a native instructive pattern for uh, gene expression and for anatomy. And the reason we know it's instructive is because if you go in, let's say with optogenetics or with other tools and change this electrical pattern, not move any cells, but just change the pattern, then you can get, for example, those Picasso tadpoles. You can move, uh, you can move organs around at will. And I'm, I'm gonna show you that in a minute. So, so this is, this is a, a, a normal uh, pattern that is necessary for correct uh, craniofacial development. Here's a pathological pattern. So this embryo was injected with a human oncogene. And so something like, um, uh, a KRAS mutation or something like that. And, and here it's going to form a tumor, right? And the tumor is going to start to spread. But before that happens, before it becomes histologically apparent, you can already see with this voltage dye, here are the cells that have depolarized and shut off the electrical connections to their neighbors in a way that's going to basically revert them back to their unicellular ancient lifestyle. Once you're electrically disconnected from this grid, the rest of the animal becomes just external environment, that computational boundary, whereas before it was large, it was a group working on a, a, a liver or, or a, you know, a kidney or something like that. It now shrinks to the level of a single cell and all your goals become single cell goals, you know, proliferate, migrate to where life is good and so on. And, there, and, and this, this ends up being metastasis and, 
uh, and conversion and metastasis. So, so this is a pathological pattern. So what we then developed was a set of tools that designed that that uh, were designed to allow us to manipulate these bioelectrical gradients in vivo. So if, the, if we thought they were functional, we ought to be able to control them to get the collective to do something different. And so this is important to say that we do not do any external field application. We don't have any electromagnetic uh, components here. There are no electrodes. There are no waves. Um, there's no magnetism. It's all um, molecular physiology. And the way it works is you can you have two things you can control in any tissue. You can control which cells electrically couple to which other cells. And so we target these gap junctions, we can mutate them, we can open them, close them. Or, and this is basically synaptic, the controlling synaptic plasticity, or we can control the various ion channels opening, again, opening and closing them to actually set the voltage of the individual cells. And this would be the equivalent of some sort of intrinsic plasticity if this was uh, neuroscience. And again, we can use uh, dominant uh, mutations of channels, we can use drugs, we can use optogenetics, um, light, and so on. And so when you do this, uh, something very interesting happens. Now, when I first, this was, you know, back while well, around the year 2000, um, I was first setting up these tools and, 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 and we wanted to uh, control uh, bio, these, these bioelectric states. It was thought that resting potential is a housekeeping parameter. And basically the standard assumption was that um, if we if we perturb it, the cells would die, and you would get un uninterpretable toxicity. That was that was the thought. So I'm going to show you that that in fact that's not at all what happens because these bioelectrical states are not just readouts, and they're not just um, just yet more molecular machinery, but they're actually the information bearing medium for these large scale modifications. So one thing you can do is you can take some cells in the frog that are going to become gut, so they're endodermal cells. And you can inject one of several uh, types of ion channels that will set up, or in this region that's going to be part of the gut, will set up a voltage pattern, a distribution of voltage that's very similar to what happens when the native eyes come in. And sure enough, if you recapitulate that pattern somewhere else, the cells are using that pattern to <clears throat> decide what they're going to build. And that pattern tells them to build an eye. And here they go, they will build an eye out of endodermal cells. Now, in, in the textbook, it will say that, that only anterior ectoderm is competent to become I up here. And that's true if you use canonical inducers like PAC6, the master um, regulator um, transcription factor. But if you go upstream of that and actually re-specify the bioelectric pattern, then you can induce these eyes anywhere on the tail and the gut, anywhere you want. And if you make these uh, tails, these eyes rather, they can have all of the same uh, components that normal eyes have. So they'll have lens and retina and optic nerve and so on. And here's an interesting thing. If you label the cells that you've directly injected with the ion channel, let's say we label them with beta, beta galactosidase, so they're blue. And this is a cross section through a lens sitting out in the flank somewhere. What you'll see is that there are two, two, uh, two inductions here. The first induction is by us putting a, 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 a imposing a particular bioelectrical state that causes these cells to decide to become a lens. That's the first induction. The second induction is that these cells with their aberrant voltage potential actually recruit their neighbors, the brown cells here, which are not labeled, which were never directly modified by us, recruit them into this project of, of building this larger scale structure, this, this nice round lens. So, so it's a non-cell autonomous effect. And when we see this again and again, that there's this this, this ability of these bioelectrical signals to uh, not just to specify cell fate, uh, but, but to actually specify organ type and position and, and things like that. So we can make eyes, we can make ectopic hearts. Here's a, here's a secondary heart. We can make um, limbs and brains and some other things, and then many things that we can't yet make. Now, let's, let's look at another, uh, another example. Here's a planarian. And one of the most interesting things is that if you chop off the head and the tail, this middle fragment, knows exactly how many heads it's supposed to have. It puts one head here, it puts a tail here. And the way it does that is because as soon as you amputate, there's this voltage gradient that's set up where the red, the depolarized region tells the worm how many heads it's supposed to have. So what we can do is we can go in and target this region using drugs, using basically ion channel modifying drugs to depolarize this region. And when you do that, you get a two-headed animal. These cells are perfectly happy to make a head. The information of how many heads you're supposed to have comes from this electrical gradient. If you change the gradient, they'll happily make two heads. You can make two-headed two animals. You can make no-headed animals. 
all kinds of interesting behavioral experiments to be done that, that we can discuss if there's time. Um, but uh, what's important here is that they're much like uh, there's no there's no genomic editing here. So so this is this is purely purely physiological. And not only can I ask this animal to make a second head of the correct type, I can actually ask it to make heads belonging to other species. So here's, we took, we started off with a triangular headed worm like this, amputate the head, perturb for about 48 hours, the ability of cells to talk to each other electrically. And what happens is the electric circuit is unable to settle to the correct attractor. And when they do settle stochastically, sometimes they settle to the correct shape, but sometimes they make round heads or flat heads. And in doing so, they recapitulate um, the, the, uh, the state of flat headed species like this P. felina or round headed species like this S. mediterranean. It's not just the shape of the head, it's also the shape of the brain and the distribution of stem cells that is exactly like these other species. Again, no genomic editing here, perfectly wild type genome. And these animals, once, once the electric circuit settles, there's a good chance that it'll settle into an, uh, an inappropriate attractor that's actually uh, associated with a completely different head shape that in fact other species are, are using natively. Now, you can also knock the system into attractors that are not being used to my knowledge by any system. And you can really, uh, you can really get far uh, from the normal planarian shape. You can make animals that are uh, spiky like this. You can make animals that are, uh, that are cylindrical like this or a combination of a flat animal with a, with a tube growing out into the third dimension. Now, um, I'm going to show you in a minute that uh, this is uh, what this is all about is, is predictive control over large scale anatomy. This is not about making weird, um, you know, aberrant uh, teratologies and so on. The idea is that we can show how much of this is actually under bioelectrical control and then use computational techniques to gain, uh, to gain good, uh, good predictive uh, control over it. And so uh, this is, and, and this is a good time to think about the, the role of the anatomy in this whole, of the genome in the, in, the, in the anatomy of this whole process. The typical metaphor that we hear is that uh, the DNA or the genome is the software and that the cell is the hardware that, that interprets this. And that's not a bad analogy at the single cell level when you're thinking about phenotypes of proteins and pathways. But at the level of anatomy, uh, I would suggest a, a, a different metaphor. And the different metaphor that works better in at the, to understand the anatomical control is, is this. Actually, what the genome does is specify all of the hardware that the cell gets to have. So all of the specific ion channels that are here are determined by the, by the gene expression. But we know from, uh, from, from basic neuroscience and also from, from computer technology that if you make a very simple circuit, this is, this is a flip-flop circuit right here. If you, if you nail down the hardware, what you can have is a circuit that can store multiple different uh, pieces of information depending on the current flow through the system and store it stably, okay, which is a memory. A flip-flop is a basic kind of memory. And you don't need to move or change any of the hardware in order to change to store a zero or a one in this very simple electrical circuit. So in fact, in, with our modeling, you can, you can see that the same thing is true if you set up a, a, field of, a field of cells with a particular where every single cell is expressing exactly the same set of ion channels, what you actually make is an excitable tissue where very rich patterning can take place. It's a little bit like uh, Turing, Turing patterns, right? There's self spontaneous symmetry breaking and self-organization. But all of this happens with a completely constant proteome. You don't need to change these ion channels because they can open and close. And so now all of the dynamics are at the electrical circuit level, not, uh, not um, with the proteins underneath. And so the prediction of this, of this way of thinking about it is this, you should be able to edit the software, meaning, meaning change the information stored in the system while keeping the hardware constant. And in particular, just to remind you, the, the, the piece of information that we want to change is the set point. We want to change the, the set point towards which cells are working in this uh, error minimization scheme. So let's let's think about how to do that. So so here's our normal planarian. We've cut off the head and the tail. We got the middle fragment. We perturb the electric circuit according to this model that we've developed. And here's your two-headed animal. Now we ask a simple question. Here's our two-headed animal. We uh, give it uh, you know give it a couple of weeks to get everything settled down. Um, cut off the primary head. Cut off this crazy ectopic secondary head. 
Some people think, oh, you somehow epigenetically reprogram this posterior tissue. Fine, we'll, we'll cut it off, we'll throw it away. All, we, all that remains is a normal middle fragment here that didn't have any head tissue in it. We do this in plain water, no more manipulations of any kind. The genome is wild type. We haven't edited the genetics, the genomic sequence at all. So surely the prediction would be that you should have, a, you should get back to a single-headed worm. Once you cut off this thing, you should come back to, you should be back to a single-headed worm. Now the interesting thing is that if you actually model the state space of the electric circuit that's involved here, what you find is that there are there are multiple stable points. One is here, a very stable point around the single-headed shape like this. But there's another stable point around the double-headed shape. And so that suggests an interesting idea that is it possible that when you amputate this thing, the bioelectrical circuit will still remember that it needs to make two heads. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. Um, when you amputate these in perpetuity, as far as we can tell, forever, two-headed animals will continue to give rise to two-headed animals, even despite their wild-type genome, in plain water, no more manipulation. And we can, in fact, uh, if we want to, we can, we can um, set the bioelectric circuit back to normal and it goes back to being a single-headed animal. So uh, a normal uh, planarian body, as, as, as you're going to see, is able to store a couple of different, at least, probably more, but we've nailed down two, uh, ideas of what a correct planarian is supposed to look like. And this is, what, uh, this is, this is how you can see this. So here's a single-headed planarian. And if we look at the molecular markers, the anterior marker is here in the head, not in the tail. And if you amputate, you get a perfectly normal single-headed animal, fine. Here's another anatomically normal animal. Again, molecular markers are all normal, anterior in the head, no anterior back here, no anterior marker back here. But if you amputate this one, suddenly you get a two-headed animal. Why would you get a two-headed animal? Because in the meantime, what we've done is we've bioelectrically changed the, the stable pattern to say, no, now you need to have two heads. Now, here's the critical part of this. This electrical map here is not a map of this two-headed animal. This electrical map is a map of this one-headed animal, meaning that the, the bioelectricity uh, distribution is not simply a map of whatever the anatomy is doing. The same single-headed single anatomy can store at least one of two different stable representations of what it's going to do if it gets injured in the future. If you're interested in neuroscience and, and the, how counterfactuals are remembered in the brain, this, I think, is sort of the evolutionary precursor to being able to remember things that are not happening now, either things that happened before or might happen in the future. It's a counterfactual memory. It's the ability to store a representation of a, of a worm towards which the fragment is going to build if it gets injured. So it sits perfectly comfortably as a single headed animal with this pattern until you cut. And at that point, that, 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 that memory uh, is no longer latent and it actually becomes functional. And that's how, uh, that's how, we, get, uh, that's how we get this, uh, this, this propagation of these two headed worms. So we are building uh, some, some very uh, sort of um, quantitative molecular uh, biophysical models to really understand the state space of the circuit to understand how uh, the circuit uh, minimizes free energy and eventually lands in one of these attractors, hopefully the right one, but not necessarily the right one, and tying it into exactly the same formalism for how people in machine learning think about networks, electrical networks that can store patterns and can actually uh, repair those patterns when pieces of the information are missing. This is all very well-trodden ground in um, in, in machine learning. And we think that some of these same strategies that we use now have, were discovered by evolution long ago. And be, beyond, frog, beyond uh, uh, worms, uh, this, is, this, is a kind of, this is the beginnings of, a, of, of our roadmap for, um, uh, for regenerative medicine. Because what we found is that, for example, if you have a frog and the frog, frogs do not regenerate their legs the way that salamanders do, you amputate the leg, 45 days later, there's basically nothing. Uh, there's no blastema um, and there's no, there's no regenerate. What we can do is we can apply a cocktail of ion channel drugs that uh, serve as a stimulus to kickstart a very complex cascade. So what you see here is immediately the MSX1 uh, blastema marker becomes turned on. Uh, the, leg starts, uh, the leg starts growing. 
uh, already you have um, the toes and here's a toenail. And eventually you get a very respectable leg here and it's touch sensitive and motile. Okay, so the animal is, can, can use it. So a couple of interesting things about this. One is that much like when we created an eye or induced um, a second head on a planarian, inducing this leg, we don't provide all the information to micromanage the process. Right? We, we have no idea how to build a planarian head from scratch or how to make an eye or how to make a leg. What we have found is a trigger for a subroutine that this, uh, that, 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 um, this, this tissue already knows how to do. And the decision for what it's going to do, scar or produce various types of organs, can be, is, is part of an electric circuit that we can guide, we can, we can, we can manage. So that's, that's the first interesting thing. The second thing is that in keeping with this idea from the beginning that that one of the hallmarks of the collective intelligence of these cells in, in, in responding to novel situations is that they can get to the final uh, outcome through, through novel paths. And if you actually look at this, at this intermediate stage of this leg, this is nothing like what frog legs look like when they're developing in the first place. So it eventually gets to a very good uh, frog leg shape here, basically indistinguishable from the control. But the intermediate path through morphospace, space, the ability of the system to navigate that anatomical morphospace, space is amazing because it does not follow the same path that frog limbs normally follow where they make a paddle and then they, you know, there's apoptosis that kills off the space between the, the digits and so on. That's not what they do. They grow, it's almost like a, it's almost like a plant meristem where you get the central stalk with this nail and then off to the side, you get these toes and eventually the whole thing remodels into a leg. So the re remarkable ability to, to get its job done in a, in a different way. So uh, now we, this is, this is not just things that apply to, to frog and worm. We've done, we've done some work um, with David Kaplan and um, Lauren Black and others uh, on human mesenchymal stem cells and cardiomyocytes. And you can control the kinds of things that you can see in vitro, um, differentiation, proliferation, wound healing. But I think that's not what the bioelectricity is for. What the bioelectricity is really for in terms of why evolution uses it and why we should be interested in it is because it allows us to exploit the modular nature of the anatomical decision making because we can control very large scale outcomes, not micromanage the, the, um, the details. And uh, here I have to do a disclosure. So uh, David Kaplan and I are both um, co-founders of this company called Morphoceuticals Inc., where we're trying to take the things that we learned uh, about uh, frog leg regeneration and move them towards mammals. So our goal is now we're, we're now in rodents trying for limb regeneration using the same strategies and using these wearable bioreactors. And the idea is to, again, kickstart regeneration, not micromanage it, not try to babysit all of the uh, different cell types and, and, and growth factors and everything else has to go in, but, but, but kickstart a trigger very early on and convince the cells with an aqueous protective environment that it's basically that, uh, that regeneration can proceed in, in the way that it would in a salamander or in, a, in an embryonic uh, mammal uh, during, this, during this adult phase. Okay, so, so that's, that's kind of where, where one of the research uh, programs is going. Um, I, I should point out this, that um, it is already known how it is that voltage change impacts the transcriptional machinery. Um, people often sort of say that, that it would be great if we understood how voltage controls gene expression. We basically do. There are, we already know about six ways that, that voltage change transduces down into second messenger pathways and controls gene expression. Um, and this has uh, typical mechanisms like, like calcium, which if, you know, neuroscience is very familiar with, other things like voltage sensitive phosphatases, um, uh, neurotransmitter transporters. We, we already know how this works at a single cell level. This transduction machinery is, has, been, has been dissected. In fact, also some of the downstream targets have been identified. So the genes that are controlled by this, all of your favorite BMPs, sonic hedgehogs, um, FGFs, all of these kinds of things are in fact the redistribution of morphogens in the examples that I showed you. Uh, all, all of this, this is known both from specific candidates and through unbiased, let's say, um, RNA-seq and, uh, and microarray types of things. We know this, but, but, but what's interesting is that these, these answers as to how it works on a single cell level have been fairly um, 
uh, uh, unhelpful in understanding the large scale picture that we're really interested in. And it's very much analogous to this multi-scale problem in neuroscience. You can, you can track the pathway and, and we do. And in every paper, you have to sort of go from the channel to the transduction machinery, which genes are downstream. So you can do all this. But, but that actually leaves open some, some much deeper questions about how the collective makes decisions. And so for that reason, we make the, we, we, we've uh, made the simulator, and this was created by our center member and collaborator, Alexis Pytak. And what it allows us to do is to build models of both molecular uh, uh, networks like GRNs together with the various uh, biophysics uh, uh, steps that happen. And you can simulate every cell having these various circuits and then you can try to build a full stack model that integrates from the molecular steps to the tissue level physiology, like every cell has various channels. What is the electrical pattern and going to be in this tissue? What does that look like on an axial polarity level? You know, where's the head, where's the tail? And then can we uh, extract from this the actual rules of the decision making? Can we turn this into a kind of algorithmic description that looks like this? that makes it much easier for us to control the process. Because now this is almost like a high level programming language where we can see, okay, here are the measurables and here are the decision points that the circuit is using to control large scale patterning modules like make a head, make an eye. And so, so what, we, what, we're, what we're doing is, is, is literally integrating every part of this so that you can build it up and then exert all your manipulations at this level. So you could have your simulator and ask questions like, why does the, uh, the head tail gradient rescale when you cut the planarian into four pieces, you know, how does that work? And that, and, and you can't see that by, by drilling down into single cells, you have to come back out with that, um, with that uh, information and build these, these collective, uh, collective kinds of models. And the other nice thing about these models is that they are the perfect fodder for machine learning approaches to do two things, to infer better models from data, Okay, and we've 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 done we've done some of that, um, and uh, also then to interrogate those models for interventions. And so here's some software that uh, that anyone can um, can can play with if you want to uh, to download and and kind of simulate all this. And and we've shown that you can actually use machine learning to find models that are really good at explaining uh, functional data sets. In other words, you know, you did something to the system and then, this, and then something else happened. What, what is a model that explains that? And then find these kind of needle in a haystack interventions that are, um, that are ways in which you could perturb it to get it to do what you want. Okay? So that, that, I think, is the kind of the, 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 the future of using this for regenerative medicine. So let's, let's talk specifically about um, a couple of applications in the last, uh, in the last few minutes. Um, the first thing, the first thing is, is, again, the, the, the cancer issue. So, so I've shown you that you can, you can track the, uh, the, 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 the shrinking of these kinds of um, uh, computational boundaries from, from, from that of the organ or whole body scale to single cells. And you can use this as, there's an obvious uh, application here as a kind of um, diagnostic modality, right? Um, it's screening for cancer and so on. But functionally, what's, what's really important is that first of all, you can induce basically uh, a, a conversion of normal melanocytes. So, so here they are, these, these little, little black dots are pigment cells, they're melanocytes. If you depolarize a very specific cell population in the animal, not the melanocytes themselves, but a, but a different cell population, we call them instructor cells for an obvious reason, they, uh, those cells tell the melanocytes what to do, in particular to stay nice, cooperative um, uh, melanocytes under control. If you block their ability to signal, what happens is basically metastatic melanoma. These normal melanocytes convert to these crazy, uh, uh, really, really um, kind of uh, a long stringy things that start to crawl, crawl away. They dig into the brain, they dig into the neural tube, they start to um, um, invade. Uh, here they are all through the blood vessels. This is basically uh, exactly like a melanoma type of behavior. And you can see here, these blue cells, these are the ones that we actually depolarized they are the ones that are now failing to keep the normal melanocytes behaving correctly. And the melanocytes are just at this point, they're, 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 they're going on their own. So it's a voltage change in the environment. There's nothing genetically wrong with these animals. There are no oncogenes. There were no carcinogens, no um, uh, nothing, nothing like that. Uh, but, the, but this voltage change is a, is a physiological switch away from the cooperation of cells toward embryogenesis and towards single cell uh, single cell behavior. Now, what's cool is that you can override this. So if we inject an oncogene and they make these tumors, of course, they're labeled with the red fluorescent protein. What you can do is co-inject a channel 
and you can force these cells to stay electrically coupled to their neighbors, despite what the oncogene is trying to get them to do. And here, while, while that uh, dominant negative uh, KRAS, P53, whatever, while they're uh, blazingly expressed, there's no tumor. It's the same animal. There's no tumor because these cells are coupled to this electrical network that forces them towards a, uh, to a, to a proper tissue fate. Okay. So that's, so that's, so, so that's where our um, sort of uh, cancer applications are going is to, and we've done this with light, with optogenetics and so on. And now we're in human, uh, human cells to try to, uh, try to use this uh, to target, um, target uh, carcinogenic behavior in, in human cells. The other thing that is important is again, to think about the, the level of control that's possible with this. Um, here is a normal tadpole brain. So you see forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. And what you can do is if you, for example, uh, it, it introduce a mutated notch protein. So notch is a very important neurogenesis gene. You can mutate it and introduce a dominant mutation. You can see forebrain is basically gone. Midbrain and hindbrain are just a bubble. These animals have no behavior to speak of. They, 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 you know, they lay there, they do nothing. Um, you can do the same thing with alcohol, nicotine, various teratogen exposures. What you can do is build a computational model. And again, this is the work of Alexis uh, Pytak, uh, Pai, who's a, um, a staff scientist in my group and, our, and, and a few collaborators. Uh, what you can do is you can build a computational model that asks a simple question. What determines the shape and size of the brain? And there's a particular bioelectrical pattern that's required for the brain. And then under, on these backgrounds of teratogens or even notch mutation, you can ask the model a question. You can say, if this pattern is disturbed, such as it is here, what channels would I have to open or close to get back to the correct pattern? And the model, will, and the model told us, and it said there's a particular channel HCN2, which can help us sharpen these boundaries, even though there are massive defects in the notch signaling and the, you know, with these various other uh, pathways, you can still reinforce these boundaries by opening HCN2. And sure enough, if you do it with drugs, or if you do, or if you just misexpress HCN2, you can get back to a normal brain shape, a normal brain gene expression, and in fact, normal IQ. These animals get their behaviors back and their learning rates back. So, so here's what this is. This is using a very specific computational model to, uh, to, to, to rationally manipulate the electrical signaling to get back to a very complex organ morphogenesis. And so the whole, pi the whole um, sort of roadmap looks a little bit like this. If you, we already have uh, expression data, profiling data on which tissues in the body express which channels. So that's already known. This it needs, needs a lot more work, which is if you knew what the voltage pattern was supposed to be in various healthy tissues under various conditions. So basically physiomic profiling is needed. Then we have this uh, computational um, uh, simulation engine, which is able to uh, say, if you want to go from the incorrect pattern to the correct pattern, which of these channels would you have to open and close, okay? And that tells you immediately what uh, cocktail of ion channel drugs you would need to use. And so we've, we've developed uh, this, uh, this, uh, this pipeline. You can, you can again, um, you, can, you can play with it here and, and, and choose your tissue and, and so on. And the idea is that something like 20% of all drugs are ion channel drugs. And these things form an incredibly convenient toolkit of what we call them electroceuticals because if you have the right computational model, you can repurpose these, which and the, the human safety data is, is, is done on, on, on these things. People already take them for all kinds of, all kinds of uses. And they have a massive applicability in tweaking the bioelectrical signals. Now, another nice thing about this kind of approach is that once the bioelectric circuit has made its decision, the downstream steps that are in second messengers then gene expression, everything else, it can be as long as you want. So for example, in the case of the frog, uh, a one day, 24 hour application of a particular cocktail gives you 13 months of leg growth, right? And uh, the, you know, it's, 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 you, you don't have to micromanage that whole process. It's, it's just figuring out what electrical state is gonna shift the tissue towards a particular uh, goal state that all of the cells are going to work towards. So um, I'm just gonna close here and summarize as follows. There's this really important layer of physiological decision-making that sits between the genotype and the anatomy. And it's becoming a really tractable target for biomedicine and also synthetic bioengineering because we can now see how the electrical dynamics that are operating in that tissue encode particular 
anatomical layouts towards which the cells continue to build. And evolution apparently discovered very early on that this electrical signaling is a really convenient medium for computation and global decision making. It's not an accident that um, uh, all nervous systems use it and, and all of our computer technology uses it. Um, uh, Ion channels, especially the voltage gated ion channels are basically voltage gated current conductance as their transistors, right? And that's, that's a very powerful uh, architecture that evolution found long before we did for forming feedback loops, memory circuits, and so on. And we think that cracking this bioelectric code can help reveal how cell networks make decisions in large scale anatomy. Not just how individual cells uh, decide what type of cell they're going to be, but actually the, the, the real question of growth and form. Where, where do these complex uh, uh, patterns reside? And we can now rewrite some of these patterns, such as, for example, in the planarian or, or in, the, in the frog. And new um, uh, machine learning tools are coming online to help us design strategies for all kinds of uh, all kinds of applications, so um, I would like to thank uh, the people um, in my group who did the work. Uh, these are all the, the postdocs and, and students, um, and and uh, and others who did the work that I showed you today. Um, here are all, um, some of our uh, collaborators who are, are working with us. Of course, the model systems that we work with, all kinds of all kinds of animals, and uh, our funders. Uh, very grateful to them. Um, Again, Disclosure, uh, Morphoceuticals Inc. is the company for our frog re limb regeneration work. And, um, you know, just in the end, I always like to show uh, a video of these two-headed animals. The first time I reported these data at a meeting, someone stood up and said, that's impossible. Those animals can't exist. And so now I make sure that I bring a video.